Okay, so uh, we'll just uh, go through this. I'm going to start just by the basics and then we'll just move right into it and there's several videos, uh, short little clips all along the way. Uh, so uh, this is a posterior approach uh, to the cervical spine, which I think is really the best approach uh, for the most utilitarian. Uh, this is a picture of the positioning in Germany. So they actually, uh, Dr. Rutten uses tongs uh, and then uh, to position the patient. And then the biggest problem with this is the getting the shoulders out of the way, particularly with men, particularly with big thick necks. Uh, tough to do it. So I don't use tongs, uh, but they actually, if, if the table is tilted, there are kind of uh, wrist wraps around this uh, fella and then uh, the, it pulls down with maybe 10 and 15 pound weights on each arm. What I use is a, a, just a flat table. I put a roll underneath the chest, just about where that uh, corner of that table is located, and then uh, enough to kind of flex their head forward, and then I tape using three inch uh, silk tape or just one of the adhesive tapes that doesn't stretch. I'll go down and just pull their shoulders down as much as I can. I you know, I always thought, geez, am I pulling too hard? But I've never had any problems uh, with uh, pulling their shoulders down. So, and then. Uh, the trick is that if you can't get the shoulders down enough to C6-7 uh, for those levels, 7-T1 uh, uh, is even worse, uh, then you have to tilt the x-ray just ever so much, maybe just uh, 5 degrees or thereabouts, and uh, get the wig-wag right. But the tilting, the, you know, the arcing uh, just off-center is what makes it so you can see it. And usually if you're careful, you can see the uh, uh, vertebral bodies. So in this example here, we're going to do a 6-7. Uh, uh, we're going to do the left. This is a large disc herniation, 6-7 on the left. Uh, this is just to mention, as I said before, if you're going to do this surgery, you've got to, it's really like shoulder arthroscopy. You want to keep the bleeding at a minimum. And the best way to do that is to maintain a systolic blood pressure of 90 or less. So uh, the first line to draw is in the AP position and you just put the guide rod up along the facet column on the uh, side there and just draw a line. This is going to get you right in the middle of the facets. The next part, I use a spinal needle to actually get myself parallel to the disc space at 6-7. Uh, in this case, I, I want to be uh, parallel to the disc space with my approach and I want to be just slightly distal to the disc space. Since I've got to go down to the uh, where the facet, uh, the descending facet of six, is going to be, you know, is going to be fairly a little bit distal to the disc space. That's where I'd like to be. Otherwise, if you're at the disc space, you just you got to do more work to angle down. Next thing is, uh, you want to be sure. <clears throat> in the beginning, when I tried to do these, I just made a superficial incision and did the superficial fascia, uh, and it just wasn't enough. So I, then I'd put the obturator in thinking I could push the obturator through the deep fascia of the neck. No way. And it gets actually, then you're trying to put too much pressure on it and it's actually dangerous. So the point is that you want to be using a number 11 blade, number 7 handle, and put the knife all the way down to the facet bone. That way when they put the obturator in, it's, there's no resistance and you're going to be in the right place. So here's the obturator placement. As you can see, we're just at the bottom end of the disc space at 6-7, and we're really parallel to the disc space. Okay, I want you just to um, just take note here. This is the approach. This is 6-7. We're going to be, all we're going to be trying to do on this whole procedure is to just lateralize the inner laminar space. And so it's going to start like this. We're going to be up in here, and we're going to be starting to, you know, go to the lamina of six, the facet joint we're going to see. Then we're going to thin out this section here. So we're going to just be extending the inner laminar space laterally. That's really a lot of the operation, just thinning the bone. So at the end, when you lift off the remaining portion of the bone, you're going to see the exiting nerve root. So here we are. Uh, this is just the first part where you're just going to take some of the muscle off of the descending facet. So just removing it, grasping it. <clears throat> the next part is using the thermal probe a little bit. <clears throat> now we're going to start to prepare the descending facet. So just like it was in the picture, uh, this is going to be the the descending facet is going to be here. The facet is, you know, the facet joint is going to be there. Inner laminar space there. 
and the uh, uh, lamina of seven is going to be right there. <clears throat> so it's a combination of the grasper, the thermal probe, And again, this is the, you're, there's the inner laminar space right there, and we're just going to make it visible, and then we're going to lateralize it a little bit. <coughs> so there's the there's the there's lamina of six, inner laminar space right there. Again, there's the there's the there's the descending facet. There it is, right there. You can see now we're kind of looking. There's the inner laminar space. And there you can see now the lamina of seven. So the inner laminar space is right there. Uh, lamina of six, lamina of seven, and we're going to lateralize the inner laminar space. Lamina of six, facet joint. Lamina of seven, inner laminar space. This is just an intraoperative x-ray to kind of get a sense of where we are. If you kind of wonder, we're still, you know, we're looking at the, you know, there's the descending facet we're going to be on top of. There's the disc space with the disc herniation. Okay, here's the burr. We're going to start uh, burring now the uh, lamina of six. And we're going to be coming, as we come this area down here, we're coming lateral. Uh, to actually, you know, we'll see the facet joint a little bit better. But this is just the lamina of six. There's the inner laminar space right there. More lamina of six coming down toward the facet joint. Inner laminar space. Okay, now we're going to be preparing the caudal lamina, lamina of seven. So there it is right there. You can see that we're using the burr. Uh, we're really right in the middle of the interlaminar space and we're trying to just actually prepare it distally and come, come lateral. Now we're going to be thinning it more with the oval burr. That's what we're going to start with first. <clears throat> so this is good to make some headway uh, going caudal. And when you sometimes, there is the epidural space, so it's not unusual to, when you're drilling through the bone, you just kind of get through and you'll see the epidural space kind of poking its head in your direction, which is okay. If there's that little hole we saw for the epidural space. We're going to continue to come lateral and we're going to be thinning out the caudal lamina of seven. When we thin it out enough with the oval burr, we're going to switch to the diamond burr. This does two things. One, it actually reduces the possibility of bleeding. And number two, it have, you have much firmer, finer control. It's, uh, uh, you can just go down and if you poke through a little bit, uh, you're, you know, the burr is going to protect you from going too far uh, into the uh, spinal canal. Here's more of the diamond burr. We're just thinning out the caudal lamina of seven and we're moving here lateral. There, so there's the facet joint right there to the left. This is the ascending facet of seven. <clears throat> it's easy to, you're gonna see it kind of air in the epidural space. But again, with the diamond tip, it doesn't grab or cut anything. It's just basically just leaving it very thin because the next thing we're going to do is use the kerosens to remove this thin layer. So the idea is here on the particularly the caudal lamina, ascending facet, thin it out as much as we can uh, before we switch over and, and actually uh, open the inner laminar space and then cut away the bone. Here we're going to cut the flavum now. We've, we've made the inner, the inner laminar space big enough and we've lateralized it. There's the flavum there, some little basket forceps. And we can immediately see the dura right there in front of us. The goal here is to find the lateral edge of the myelon. That's critical. Uh, there's a variable takeoff to the exiting nerve root but you have to see, before you poke around or do anything else or find the exit nerve, you have to find the lateral edge of the myelon. 
So the goal is to see it, so we're going to use the kerosens. There we, find, we see the lateral edge of the myelin, right there. Right there. Now we're just going a little bit more lateral so we can find the exiting nerve root, which we're going to see in a second. But there is the lateral edge. That means you've gone far enough lateral, to at least to get started with. You, you now can look for the exiting nerve root. Keep going lateral because now we're going to look for the exiting nerve root. You can barely see it right there. We're going to see it better here in just a moment. It's always covered with a thin fascial layer. Starting to see it there, but we're going to see it better in a second. There's the lateral edge of the myelin. That's just absolutely key to see. You know that you're far enough lateral to begin the, the, you know, the dissection. <clears throat> Flavum, exiting nerve root, using the uh, electrocautery probe for control of bleeding as well as just kind of removal of some of the soft tissue, which we're going to remove here in just a moment a little bit better. Here we are, lateral edge of the myelin. We're using the grasper now to remove this very thin layer uh, 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 that's covering the nerve root, exiting nerve root, which is coming this direction. It's coming right down toward the floor. Okay. It's revealing itself better and better, but we're going to see it really good here in just a minute. But you can see how it kind of comes off the underside of the cord. It's not coming right off the edge like I would, like I, you know, probably thought in the beginning. It's coming off kind of underneath the cord. Bleeding control is, you just got to stay on top of the bleeding. You, again, you're bleeding down here, you don't know where you are, it's, it's problematic. There it is, you're starting to see it really clearly now. With, uh, but look at how it comes out from underneath the, the cord, not right off the side. Okay, taking a little bit more of the thinned out bone. Now this particular disc herniation was uh, up high, it was above the disc space. Uh, which I said is another reason for the anterior approach not being so good because if it's above the disc base, hard to grasp and pull down. But in this situation, it's just fine because we can see the shoulder of the exiting nerve root just perfectly fine. Okay, we're, now we're going to start to push on the, there is the, uh, there's the, there's the exiting nerve root. There is the, you know, the disc protrusion herniation right there. Now you can see the exiting nerve root really well. We're using the uh, uh, probe, the thermal probe, and then the uh, pen field here in just a moment, just to kind of, there it is. That's how you're, there's the exiting nerve root heading down to the floor. There's the disc herniation right there. It's on the shoulder. And there's the edge of the myelin right there. <coughs> okay, looking good. There's the, there it is. We're going to probe the uh, disc herniation, which is pretty good sized. And kind of look and see that we're, we're, we're really over the edge. We're, fair, we're getting to be fairly far lateral and maybe a little bit anterior on the uh, side of the, uh, you know, the cervical vertebrae. Here's actually where we are right now. You can get a sense of it. Now we're going to open the herniation with the basket forceps of the little scissors. And these are going to be some sizable fragments uh, that I think, again, would be pretty hard to pull out through the anterior approach if you, one decided to do that. Anterior approach, you might be able to debulk it, but I don't think you're going to have as good of a discectomy as you're going to see right here. Okay, let's keep removing the disc fragments. It's kind of just a matter of reaching in and keep pulling out. Again, there's the shoulder, which is, uh, so to the left is cranial. 
This is the basket forceps to just be sure to cut the remaining portion of the posterior longitudinal ligament, ligament uh, and the annulus to be sure that there's no other hidden pieces uh, there. Caution, you know, you always wonder what can go wrong. So right in front of that uh, uh, little thermal probe is the vertebral artery. That's the only thing that can really get uh, any, any trouble in this approach. So you're, look at how far anterior you are on that, but if you go keep going, you're gonna be right in the vertebral artery. What's the posterior approach, cervical spine, thank you.